Async and Await can be really simple to use in C-sharp, but sometimes you want to do more than just the basics. In this video, we're going to cover some of those advanced features of Async and Await, including canceling tasks and getting status updates on tasks as they're running. If you aren't clear on what the basics of Async and Await are, watch my previous video on Async, and that covers the basics. There will be a link down in the description to that video. Now, in case you're new to this channel, my name is Tim Corey, and my goal is to make learning complex topics in C-sharp easier. On this channel, you'll find videos on a number of different topics, including a complete course I gave away for free just to help you understand how to build a real-world application from scratch. If you ever get stuck or want to see a topic covered, just leave me a comment below. And while you're here, make sure to give this video a thumbs up. So let's jump right into the demo. Here we have an app that's similar to the one we created in our first async video. Let's walk through the parts of it and we can talk about the new stuff after that. So first of all, we see we have a form here with four buttons. Now it's a little bit more than we have before, but we're gonna enable some of these new buttons. So first we have a normal execute, and what that does is it goes out and it executes a task, and it's, it's just synchronous. There's no asynchronous code, it's, it's the, you know, the normal way of doing it, I guess you'd call it. And that's gonna lock up the UI for you know one to four seconds or so while it's running. And then we have the, the async execute, and this is essentially the same thing as the normal, except we're doing it asynchronously, and so the UI is more responsive, we can move it around and all that kind of stuff while it's running. Then we did the parallel async execute, which uh, we did last time in our last video, and what this does is it it executes all the different tasks we have. In fact, we have like 10 different tasks we're doing. It executes them all asynchronously, but doesn't wait for any of them until the very end. It waits for all of them to complete. And so essentially, the tasks are operating in parallel, not in sequence. And so it's asynchronous, it allows the, the UI to uh, be responsive, but it's also much faster because we're not um, waiting in line for the next one to execute, then the next one, the next one. And then finally we have this button here called Cancel Operation. And this is a new one we're going to add today in this video, and that's the idea that while we're executing an asynchronous task, or even a parallel asynchronous task, but mostly just the asynchronous task, while we're executing it, we want to be able to pass in this cancel operation and say, you know what, we don't want to do it anymore, let's, let's stop. And so allow us to stop a long running project or, or process that's running asynchronously. We also have this right here, which is new, and it's a progress bar. So one of the things we're gonna to learn today is how to get information back from an asynchronous task that's doing a long running process asynchronously. And so the idea is you can you can bubble up a message that says, hey, here's where I am, you know, as far as I, I've done three tasks out of ten, I've done four tasks out of ten, something like that. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna track that progress on a progress bar. And it'll actually be a real progress bar, meaning when we have one task out of ten done, the progress will be at ten percent. We have five tasks out of ten done, it'll be at fifty percent. And so it'll actually show us a real look into how that, uh, that code is running in the background. And then finally down here we have our results window, which is just a text box that shows us what we've done. So that's all it really is for the, the user interface portion of it. Let's look at the code behind. Now again, I'll give my same disclaimers last time. I'm doing stuff in the code behind on a WPF form. I'm not using MVVM. These are all things I wouldn't do in a you know a real application, but this is a demo application. So just make sure that you're following the things that I say to do. You know, follow along. They are best practices, but the idea of the way I set this demo up is not best practices. I would not set up a WPF app probably at all without w or MVVM. Um, but definitely for a larger application, I would I would use MVVM. Uh, but also to have a class library separate out. I would have as little code as possible in my code behind. All these different things are important to do in the real world, 
but for a demo application, it's okay to kind of shortcut some of those things. So that's my disclaimer. Let's move back into the code. So let's do the code behind for my main window. So this main window, we have a couple of things. We have the execute sync click, async click, parallel async click, cancel click, and then the print results. So these are the, the um, events behind our buttons. And they're pretty similar in nature. We start off by creating a stopwatch. At the end, we stop a stopwatch, get the time it took, and then also um, we print out to that results window the total execution time. That way we know how long it ran. But inside of the stopwatch uh, start and stop, we have this download async, which we'll look at in a minute. It gets results, which is a list of website data model. Then we just send that off to the printer. So the print results, which is right down here, just loops through each one and says, here's the results of the website that was downloaded and the size of the data that was downloaded. So that's all there is for, you know, the, the sync does it calls the download sync, run download sync, the async, which again has an async um, on the method call. It awaits for the run download async, but everything else is the same. The parallel async does something pretty similar. It, it passes in, or it calls the run download parallel async and awaits that and then prints it out. So it's, it looks functionally identical to the async. The difference is it's calling the parallel async method. And so we'll look at that in a bit. And there's nothing for the cancel. So let's look at these methods. They're all in a demo methods class. And this is all static, so we can just call it directly. You don't have to instantiate. The first, and first thing we should see right off the bat is this uh, prep data which essentially just puts a list of websites into a list of string. And so that's all the websites will be downloading. Everyone uses the same list. That way it's the same. It's not um, different per synchronous versus asynchronous or anything like that. So you can compare apples to apples. So there's our prep data. So you'll see this call at the beginning of every method. So run download sync, that gets the data and then it creates an output um, list. And then it says, okay, for each website in our list of string, I want to download the website, get those results into a website data model class, add that to my list, and at the very end, send that list back. So it's just little tweaks on what we did in the previous video, um, clean some things up, change some things just a bit, um, but for the most part, it's exactly the same. Asynchronous, it does the same thing as synchronous. It's just that we await, again, async and await. We await the download website's async call. And then we also have the parallel, which does something very similar to the run download async. It's just that instead of awaiting each call, we add each call to a list of task website data model. And so what happens is we have this list, we add the tasks to it as they're running. And at the very end, after we've called all the all 10 websites, lower them in so they do this asynchronously and kept going, we didn't wait for it. At the end, we said, wait for all of them to be done. So when all, then grab those results and then we uh, send those results back as a list of website data model. They come out as an array, so I just converted that array to a list instead. So that's our three methods. Down here, we have a couple of private methods. The first one we'll look at is actually, we'll skip this one for a minute. We'll look at this download website. This is the synchronous version. And so it essentially just opens up a web client. It creates a new website data model. This is the output, so we know uh, what the website was that was downloaded and how much data was in it. So we call this um, on the web client, we say download string, which is a synchronous method. 
you pass in the URL. This is all baked into the .NET framework, this web client. We download the website. We put that into the uh, website data of our output model, and we send it back. So this is all synchronous. The exact same thing happens in the asynchronous download website async, but instead of calling the download string, we call the download string task async, which does it which is a um, async version of the download string. And so it, we can await for that and then send back the results when we're done. So that's, that's all we have so far. In fact, let's run this right as it is, just so you can see. Now, normal execute, my window's locked up, I can't move it around. When it's done, then we have our list of the 10 websites and a total execution time. Don't forget that the first time you run this, it's slow. So the second time you run this, it will change to you know under two seconds. Async execute allows it to move things around while we're waiting. And now it's done. Again, same amount of time. Parallel, notice the parallel is done in half a second versus the two seconds of async. So parallel is very quick. And it does allow us to move the window around. Just to show off that it really does, it's hard when it's so fast, but the first time you run this, remember it's slow, so I'll execute the parallel and then move the window around. So I'm moving the window around and it's done. Let's do this one more time just to make sure that you, you caught that. So that's just the starter boilerplate stuff we have so far. This is what we're gonna start today to move ahead and make things a little better, a little um, more advanced. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna tackle the idea of getting information back when we execute the async. So right now, if I were to start this and do the async execute, I get nothing until it's all done. When it's all done, then I have the information. We can do better than that. So let's let's do that. So let's start by going into our demo methods and looking at this run download async method. This is the one we're calling from our event. So in this method, we can pass in what's called an I progress. And it's a generic, so we have to give it a type. Let's get a string for now. We're going to change this, but let's get a string. And let's just call it progress. So what this allows us to do is every time we make progress, we can call this and it will bubble up an event to the caller. So the way we do this is we'd say progress dot, and there's only one real method here. It's report. So you can say, okay, and then we report our value back. In this case, a string. That's all there is to having progress reports in our asynchronous calls. So this progress right here will say, okay, here is the report. The report is testing, which is useless right now, but it gives us information back. So let's create a model that will have more information about where we're at in the process. So let's right click on our, our project and say add class and we'll call this class the progress report model. Let me get public and let's add a couple of properties in here. The first property I want to add is we have this list of website data model. The, this is the websites that are currently processed. And notice we add a new one every time we complete the download web website. So let's let's add a this model right here. Let's call this the um, sites downloaded, and we'll initialize that to start off. And let's also add another property that's an integer that is percentage 
complete. Start off at zero. Now, percentage complete, it's an integer, can't be, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. We're talking a number between zero and 100 because we have this progress bar here that takes a number between zero and 100. That'll be our progress percentage. So we'll have, we'll pass back. Here's how far we're, we've gone. Here's which percentage we are complete. And then also here are the sites that we've downloaded so far. So with that, instead of passing in a I progress of type string, we'll do progress report model. And then let's create a, um, a progress report model. Let's call it report equals new progress report model. And we're going to say, instead of testing here, we'll pass in report. So right now we have said, here's our I progress, which is built into the uh, to system. That's a, that's a system uh, interface. Therefore we can, don't have to worry about adding that. So I progress, here's our model we're passing in or the type it is gonna be, they're passing back actually. And here is our variable. All you do is call that variable dot report and pass in our progress report model instance. That's gonna pass that instance back to the caller. So let's populate this instance with some values. So first we're gonna say report dot sites download equals output. So that's gonna grab our current output list, add it to the sites download. And so now we'll know Okay, we've downloaded three sites. And then next, what we'll do is we'll say report dot percentage complete equals. We've got to come up with some kind of formula for the percentage complete. Well, we know that we have to download all these websites. So that's our total. In this case, I know it's 10, but let's pretend we don't. So we'll just do websites.count. That'll give us our total. We know how many we've downloaded so far because that's output. Every time we download one, we add it to output. Therefore, what we can say is output, if I can spell, dot count, now let's multiply that by 100, divided by websites dot count. So what am I doing here? Well. I take the total number of the output, which let's just pretend we downloaded two sites. That'd be two. We know that websites.count is 10. Well, two divided by 10 will be a percentage. It won't be a whole number. That's a problem. So instead what we're gonna do is we'll say, instead of being 0.2, we'll say two times 100, that's 200 divided by 10 is going to give us 20, which is 20%. And so by doing it this way and this order, I can use integers, because these are all integers, and not have any weird rounding issues where I, I lose information. So if I were to say output.count divided by website.count times 100, that wouldn't work because I'd have either a zero or a one because they're both integers. An integer division gets rounded to the nearest whole number. So doing it this way, I get a number between zero and 100. So now I have my percentage complete and I can pass back that report. Now in my call here, it's yelling at me because I haven't passed in an iProgress uh, instance. So let's create one of those. Let's actually do it outside of the watch. So before the watch, we'll create the instance, we'll call it its progress. And it's of type uh, progress report model. So again, this is built into the, um, the system namespace and it's part of the .NET framework. So we're, we're good to use it. 
So progress of type progress report model. And let's call this just progress equals new progress report model. And then we're going to say we need to hook up an event. So progress dot progress changed. This is the event we can hook into plus equals let's call it uh, report progress. Oops. And it's going to say, Hey, you haven't created that event yet. Let's go ahead and generate that method. And that's right down here. So all it's doing is creating an event for us, just like we have events here. And it's got an object sender and a progress report model E. So it's passing in that progress report model as our E. So now I can use that E to do whatever we want to get the values. So I can say, let's figure out what the, the name of this, this is right here. It's called dashboard progress. So I can say dashboard progress dot value equals e dot percentage complete. And while I'm here, I have this method called print results that takes a list of website data model. So let's go ahead and say print results e dot sites downloaded. So it's going to download or it's going to print out what's been downloaded so far. So with all that done, now I just pass in, in this execute async, I pass in my progress. So I've got this instance of progress where I've wired up an event on the progress changed event to call this report progress um, event caller or event method. And in that event, I just spit out, okay, here's a percentage, put that into the progress bar and go ahead and call this print results, which prints out all of the websites that have been downloaded and the length of each of them. So let's just try this and see what happens. We can come back and look at it a little more in depth. So let's run the async execute. And there you go. We got a progress bar and it, it goes out one at a time as we're downloading the sites. And that's gonna go faster this time because of the, uh, the second time you run. But now we can see as we're running what's happening and it's still responsive. So even as it's downloading, it's still responsive and yet it's updating the progress bar and it's updating this results window. So that is how we do progress. It starts off by passing in I progress object of whatever type you want. And so I recommend you create a type that has all the data you want in it. And then inside of our asynchronous method, whenever we want to update the status, which in our case, it makes sense to do it in the for each that way we have 10 status updates, one per site. We just call the progress dot report. It's the only method there. And it's just saying, okay, send back the whatever type that you requested. So in this case, we have a progress report model, which again, that, that's the custom one. And so we're passing that object back. And before we do so, we populate it with the relevant information. That information goes back to our caller back to the um, right here. So in this, this object, we've added an event that says, listen for any time progress changes, call this method. And so therefore that's what happens. Every time you call the report, it fires off this report progress event, which takes the data that's being passed in and does something with it. In this case, it reports to the screen via the progress bar and also the results window. So that's all there is to it. That is getting progress 
asynchronously from your method. So our method's running asynchronously. We're getting progress back as we go. The next thing we want to look at is the idea that maybe we don't want to continue on if something's running too long. Say, for example, I start downloading these websites. So I've got 10 websites that I'm downloading, and I start the process and then realize I have no internet connection. It makes no sense for me to wait for timeouts on 10 calls to the internet when I have no internet. And so I want to have some way of saying, okay, stop that, my bad, let's try again later. And the way I do that is to have a cancellation token that we pass in. And so let's set one of those up. So let's do this right on this execute async method again, since this is the one where we are actually doing things asynchronously, but we're doing them in order. We're not doing them in parallel. It makes it a little more difficult when you're doing it in parallel to cancel uh, an asynchronous method because you kind of have to wait until after something is done before you cancel. So, for example, we're going to put the cancellation right here where we say, hey, go ahead and cancel if they requested it. And that's that I'll check in 10 times after we download the first website, the second website, the third website. It will check in each time. So it makes more sense to put in this one. So let's go ahead. We're going to start to come to the very top of our main window class. And outside of any of our methods, we're going to create a cancellation token source. Now, this is in the system.threading namespace. So it may be, I've got this add already. Um, but if you don't have it add, then you'll throw an error. So let's, let's just show you how, let's call it CTS. And we'll say, let's say equals new cancellation token source right there. Now, again, if you don't have threading, you're going to get this. And you have to just do the control dot and say using system.threading. Or just type in yourself, it's up to you. So now that I have this cancellation token source, what this is is it's gonna be um, the thing that kind of controls whether or not we cancel. We're gonna call this and say, go ahead and cancel. And that's gonna cancel any method that is currently running that uses this token. So, Let's come down here to our execute async. And we're going to pass this in to our run download async. So we'll pass in as CTS dot. You pass in just the token. That's what we're going to pass in. Now, again, it's not, it's not ready for it yet. That's okay. We'll go ahead and make it ready for it in a minute. So let's come over to our demo method where I say, okay, we want to pass in, let's highlight the, hide this. We want to pass in a cancellation token. Again, that's from the system.threading namespace. So if you don't have your using statement for system.threading, you have to go ahead and add that. And let's just say cancellation token. We could call it cancellation token instead of CT. It's probably better. Let's do that. So you pass in that token, and then after, whenever, we need to check this periodically. And so if the user says, go ahead and cancel, it won't actually do anything until we get to the point where we check to see if it's canceled. So let's just make sure you understand that. That doesn't happen immediately, it happens after it's hit. So I think the logical place to add this would probably be after we do our first download. I'm assuming that you won't be so quick to hit the cancel button that we don't even run the first download. Therefore, there's no point in checking up above this. So we're just going to do cancellation token dot. And the method down here is throw if cancellation requested. 
and it's a method, returns void, that's all you do. So what's going to happen is if the cancellation token is activated, if we say go ahead and cancel that task, we're going to throw an exception essentially. And that exception is going to be the operation canceled exception. So it's going to say, hey, you cancel the operation. So it's done. Now that allows us a couple of, of benefits. First of all, it's going to stop right away and go back to our caller, but it's also going to allow us to do any kind of cleanup on the caller end that we need to do before, um, before we continue. So say we had open connections or something like that, we can go ahead and close those. Now the other thing to note is we should do some cleanup in here if we need to before we actually throw this. Now if you notice, but there is the option here is cancellation requested. That can check to see if the cancellation has been requested. So you do an if cancellation is requested, go ahead and do cleanup and then throw the if cancellation requested. So we're not going to do that because it's, it's a little overkill for what we need to do here, but I want to point that out. So now we have this cancellation token in place. All we need to do is have some way of calling that while this is running. And that's pretty simple. We have the cancel operation button, which has a click event. And we'll say CTS dot. And we have a few options here, but one of them is cancel. So that will cancel the operation. Now remember I said it returns a an exception or it throws an exception. So we need to make sure that we wrap our call. Let's actually wrap both of these in a try catch. So here's the results and printing the results. We're not going to print the results if there are no results. Therefore we'll wrap both of these in a try catch. So under the snippet menu, I have surround with, I can surround this with a try and we'll capture just the exception we need, which is the operation canceled exception. And in fact, we don't need that EX either um, because we, I won't use it. So let's just, just grab the actual exception. We're not going to rethrow it. And instead we'll just say, Let's grab the results window and we'll say plus equals and I'll do my string interpolation and just say the um, async download was canceled and let's add a system or I'm sorry environment dot new line at the end of that that way we since we are going to write out the time elapsed afterwards, I want a new line there so that it, um, it doesn't continue on the same line. So that's all we'll do. We're going to do a try. We're going to catch. We don't have to do anything with the exception, except know that if it's the operation cancel exception, we print that out to the window and then we continue on. We stop our timer and we go on our way. Let's run this. Now remember, the first time I run this, it's slow, which is actually a good thing that gives me a little bit of time to cancel the operation. So let's execute async. It's starting. I cancel it. So now I've downloaded one, two, three, four, five sites, but then I cancel the operation, and the total time was uh, just under two seconds. And we got about halfway done. So that's all there is to it. We create the cancellation token in our caller, in this case, the form. And I did it outside of any method so I can call this CTS down here in my event to say CTS.cancel. But we pass in the, can, the CTS or cancellation token source dot token. We pass that into our asynchronous method. And that's it on this end except for wrapping in a try catch. On our async call side, what we do is that we watch for that exception or that uh, cancellation token to be triggered. And when it is, we throw the exception. That's why we catch that exception and just do something, whatever it is, like in this case, just update the results window 
and then we're done. So now we actually have an asynchronous method that reports back the progress and that we can cancel halfway through. So that's really it for some advanced async stuff. I mean, we've cancellation tokens and reporting progress. That's that's some pretty advanced stuff for async, and I think it should cover most of your most of your normal needs. Now, there's gonna be some stuff where you might need to get into the task parallel library and do some advanced stuff there. But for the most part, just calling async and await, and maybe getting the progress of it or uh, being able to cancel it are all you really need. Now, I do want to touch on one thing that came up a couple of times, and that is this execute parallel async. So this right here, the way we did it, and let's go back and look at the code for this. The way we did it was we created a new task that was an asynchronous call to download the website. We created one for each website, but we didn't await them. Instead, we just add it to a list and then said, when all, grab the results and return that list. And so the question was raised, well, yes, but what about the parallel for each? That's part of the task parallel library, and it allows us to do, um, you know, it runs in parallel. So why would we recreate the wheel and do it this way? So let's go ahead and create a demo for this. I'm actually going to come up here to the run download async and copy this whole thing. I'm sorry, run download sync, not async. And I'm going to say run download parallel sync. What we're going to do is instead of doing a for each, I'm going to do a parallel for each, just to kind of show you the difference. So let's just do parallel dot for each. And the type that's return or passed in is type string. And so the first thing you pass in is the websites. And then what you do afterwards is you say, let's give it a name called site. And you say, run this code, this code right here. And then at the end of that, like so. So I kind of rearranged my for each. Let me walk you through what I did. Um, when you do parallel not for each, you have to say, this is what I'm passing in. In this case, I'm passing in a string. So this list right here of string, it knows, okay, each one's a string. So that says, okay, pass in your list. And then for each item, we're going to do an action. Now, an action is a uh, a method call essentially in line that doesn't return a value. So it's not returning a value, it's just making a call. In this case, what we're saying is do these two things. Now I'm passing in this variable site, which I created, but what site represents is each one of the websites. So essentially it's a shortened version of for each. Um, it's a little more complicated in some ways, but once you kind of understand the syntax, it makes a little more sense. So I've created this variable on the fly called site. I'm passing that into each uh, for each of these um, items and website. It's going to call this bit of code. And so it's going to download the website. And that's the site it's going to download. And it's going to add at the output. So this is the same essentially as run download sync, except for the fact that in the for each, it does each of these downloads in parallel to each other. So that's what parallel dot for each does. It says, okay, I've got a list of things. Do each one in parallel the others. So let's just change over our run download sync to run download parallel sync over here in our method call. In fact, let's run it first just to show you if I run the normal execute, it takes about four seconds or so to download. Yep, 4.2. Now I'll do it again, and it's 1.8, so almost two seconds. Let's go ahead and do nothing else except change this to use our now parallel sync. 
So it's going to use the, the um, parallel dot for each. Let's run this. We execute normally. And the first download takes 1.8 seconds. The one after that takes 0.4 seconds and 0.7 seconds and 0.4 seconds. So it executes in a similar manner to our parallel async for each as far as speed goes. Notice they, they both operate about the same speed. And so the difference is that, let me show you again. Let's start this over again. I'm going to run this again. Once I click start, I'm going to try and move my window. And watch what happens. I can't move it. Now I can move it. And so that's the difference between parallel for each and do what we did on our parallel async, where we actually created our own parallel execution. The difference is that this parallel dot for each, that's right there, the parallel dot for each, this does do them in parallel, meaning it does them all at the same time, but it does them all at the same time synchronously, meaning it locks everything up until they're all done. And so that download, the longest download, that's how long we're gonna have to wait for this to be done. Now, granted, it's a shorter amount of time than the um, than this up here. We're waiting for each one, one at a time, and the, the time is cumulative. So there is a benefit there, but it still is synchronous. Okay, so that kind of touches on that, but let's look at some ways we can kind of take more advantage of this and the reasons why you might use it. So parallel dot for each, there is some optimization that goes on underneath the hood that kind of makes sense that we want to use this, especially if we have a long list, like from a database where we need to process each record or something like that. Parallel dot for each makes a lot of sense because what happens is it spawns off tasks and batches them. So it's doing a lot of intelligent work behind the scenes to say, here's how many tasks I should be running and here's how you're doing them. Now, again, it's not creating the asynchronous tasks that allow us to um, get control back on the user interface, but it is um, spawning off those batches in a way that makes sense for the processing. So what we can do is actually wrap this whole thing in a task.run. So let's, in fact, let's just make this asynchronous. And let's just change the name. In fact, you know what? Let's make a copy of it. That way we have both versions. And we'll say parallel async, which I believe you already have one. Yep, called parallel async. Um, let's call it v2. So this is version two of the parallel async. And so what we're going to do is wrap this whole thing. Let's grab all of this. I am going to just control X to cut it out and say, let's await task.run. And this is our same syntax, whoops. There we go. All right, and we have to change this to be the um, public static async. All right, so now what we've done is, and it says, oh, one more thing. We have to change this type to be type task list of website data model. Okay, so remember that whenever you have async, it needs to return task or task of T. In this case, task of T, which T is list of website data model. So everything else about this, once we make those few changes, stays the same. So we can still run this um, asynchronously. We're still you know, awaiting things. It's still gonna do it in parallel, all that fun stuff. So now let's come back over here to our event where we say execute parallel async, and we'll just call a version two method 
which is that parallel.foreach. Let's just see how it, it behaves. Parallel execute, we can move our thing around and it's done, 1.8 seconds. Second time is um, 0.3 seconds. So again, we now have control of our UI and yet we're doing things in parallel using that parallel um, call. So now we can do is we can actually up the game again and we can grab the, um, the progress report option. Let's pass that in. And then in our for each, we can actually update our progress report. Let's grab the, um, the code for that. And we'll just paste it in down here. And we have to actually have our variable. Let's put that in right there. So now this is the same as the download sync where we have the progress report. And every time we um, add an output, we're going to update that progress report. So now we'll do the same thing that we did in here, where we'll create our progress report. We'll wire up to the report progress event. So let's grab those two things and paste them in. And then we'll pass in our progress. And that should be it. So let's go ahead and execute this. So now parallel async execute. Notice that it's doing it in parallel. It's doing it, reporting back what it's doing, and it gives us our execution time all at the same time. So it's kind of the best of both worlds there. Um, and in fact, this really is an upgrade to what we had in our previous parallel. So version two actually is better than version one. Let's go ahead and collapse these down. So the reason this is better is because we actually have the ability to report our progress one at a time whenever they're done. So again, if I do the parallel async, it's downloading and notice the order is downloading. Microsoft is first with 1,020 characters. Twitter is last at 117,000 characters. If we did the async execute, Yahoo is first and Twitter is not at the end. So notice the difference. The reason why is because that Microsoft call, which is third here, that's the quickest one. And so it's the first one that completes. So it rearranges the order, and yet we're getting that, that status report every time it's being done. So it tells us the exact one that's being done, and when it was done, if we want to capture that information too, but also the percentage as we go running in parallel. We can't really get that here because of the fact that we don't monitor each of these tasks for their completion. Instead, we wait for all of them to be done. So we don't have a real good mechanism to say, okay, now that you have done something, go ahead and report back. Now we could dive down to this and pass the, uh, the progress down to this and say, okay, report your progress from this. The problem is we might not have access to this. Now, if we did, we could pass that down. We could probably report some progress back, but notice that down here, we don't know about any of the other websites. So we don't know which ones are done, which ones aren't. So that's gonna make it a little more difficult to track who has done what. So it just makes it a little more complicated when we're doing it in parallel using this method we originally came up with. Now, this method we came up with is good for a lot of things, but reporting progress isn't one of them. So this parallel.foreach, when you wrap it in a task.run, allows us to spawn off all those different uh, threads to execute these actions, and yet it allows us to call back to our calling thread without doing that marshalling and all the rest um, or invoking. And instead what it does is it says, okay, I'm gonna report back to you. This is what I've done. And allows the report on every step along the way, which means that this method allows us to have both the progress, but also the parallel. So just, you know, a couple different things we can look at. Um, if you're doing something simple, this, this right here, 
call, add a taskable list, win all. That's really simple. But if you want to have some, some of the more advanced features like the progress, then you're going to have to go ahead and upgrade to something like this, where you do a parallel dot for each wrapped in a, a task dot run and await that. So it's kind of up to you how you want to go, how complicated you want to be, but the features are available to you either way. All right, so that's it. So we've covered the idea of having progress in our asynchronous tasks. We've covered the idea of canceling our asynchronous tasks as they're running. And we've also looked at how to run things better in parallel to also give us a progress report as we go. So in all of that runs a nice UI that's really responsive and it gives us some fun stuff like the progress bar and the updated results window. So now we're kind of creating apps where they really are real world friendly. You know, people don't like to just sit and wait hoping the application is running. Now we can show them, yes, it's running and here's what it's doing. And so that's, that's really nice. The one thing I would recommend that you think through is if you do have this idea of a button that executes asynchronously, that you gray it out and say running in here. So, you know, disable the button, you know, so set the um, enable default or something like that. And then say, you know, waiting or running or something like that in the button's text. That way people know not to click it over and over and over again. Otherwise you may have five, six, seven different calls that you really don't want to have more than one call of, especially if you're, you know, posting data or uploading a file or something like that. You want to make sure you only have one of those. So just make sure that you you'd, uh, lock down those buttons so they can't do something else since the UI is now responsive. All right. So I think that's it for this video. I hope that you got some value out of it. Go ahead and let me know down in the comments You know what your thoughts are. Is it something I missed? Is it something you want me to uh, see me cover in addition to this or even on just on a different topic? All right. Have a great time coding.